studio visit with some friends from the art group OKC Artist Collective, where I've been doing kirigami for a long time, but kind of didn't do that too much in after like uh, really middle school or high school. So then I was doing this um, studio visit and I was showing people my paperworks, which were all this kind of white copy paper. And I was just realizing that when people ask like, have you tried color? And I thought, not really, I just, if I had color paper, I would have used it, but otherwise I just, it, I found it was hard to color paper after it's been cut and folded. So um, in recent years, I've been collaborating with a friend, Emma Dafani, who's a printmaker. And that's been really fruitful because we have this nice way of um, working through our different practices and seeing how we can translate it. So all the color things you see are screen printed paper that I've worked on the designs of the pieces, but Emma has really, I've worked on the cutting and shaping and Emma has worked on getting the screen prints mostly. Um, and some of this is like, I think dyed paper to get the desired colors. And from our, uh, from my, um, what is it called? Oh, Oklahoma Contemporary had a fundraiser where Emma and I made these orchids and other tropical plants to have as a photography background. So that's what the cover photo on my event that I posted um, for this demo comes from. And you can see um, one thing I was just trying to learn is I've mostly done, I guess I was always like, liked Jurassic Park and dinosaurs, but I'd been doing birds and dinosaurs for a long time. And so here's an example of like a kind of raptor um, dinosaur that I just know how to make really kind of without even looking at any reference imagery because I've made them so many times. Um, I grew up and watching a lot of uh, nature shows and especially liking dinosaurs. Um, it's it, This is a kind of cool uh, practice for me to figure out how do I make a dinosaur from a single sheet of paper and this I'm cheating with a little glue or with a little tape, but it was really interesting when I was growing up to figure out how they could kind of stand on their own. And if I had, I think this one, I didn't have a long enough paper, but I probably could have get it pretty balanced to stand most of the challenges just getting this paper at the ankles to, um, kind of hold the weight without flexing too much. So yeah, the um, one thing, okay, I can't show my computer, but uh, my website is malcolmzachariah.com. And on there, I have some examples where Emma and I's uh, first collaboration was a desert plant installation. And so one thing that was really fun was to make a almost larger than life-size yucca plant with a flower spike. And I have it, I have the remnants here, but as it, as it gets older or like, as um, they get transported and stuff, we realize most of these have to be kind of site-specific installations that we just have to really remake again. And kind of the beauty of paper is it's not a very expensive material, so it's okay to remake things. And 
still be able to get the impact. Now you're seeing this, um, let me see how it looks. Okay, this is a lionfish. So one proposal Emma and I had was to make a coral reef. And we are, we got accepted to the AHA, I guess, gallery in Tulsa to have a kind of a duo show of us making a coral reef all out of paper. And so that is scheduled for the end of this year. Um, it's It had been pushed back due to COVID, um, the pandemic. So this is in a way helped us kind of just reset and think, okay, what can we do? And this is all hand cut paper. And it's actually a single sheet of paper that I folded in half. One thing that I kind of learned, and it's an interesting way of growing up and figuring out things with paper, but also learning that that kind of mimics biology, where if you've noticed the dinosaur, even these flowers and the fish, they all have a symmetry of two sides called bilateral symmetry. And I really like the uh, kind of the aspect of um, using one sheet of paper that I fold in half. So that's kind of how I started with a lot of these things. Here you can see these are some mock-ups of another fish that I was making called a royal grandma. And I was just working out the shapes. So I often use this plain copy paper to figure that out. Um, oh, hi, Lawrence. So yes, I, I've been um, kind of working through this and this is kind of interesting. So for our Oklahoma contemporary photo background um, installation, Emma figured out how to do screens of the orchid patterns I wanted. And what we found is that it's actually a lot easier for Emma to do the um, printing than me to cut because cutting and folding takes a while. So I can kind of show, this is a good example. Emma fortunately did these kind of, um, it's, it's basically like following the dotted line, but there's only a certain point to how much you can um, draw out the pattern. So, there's kind of a little um, balance between how much you can pre-designate and how much just comes from experience of uh, making things. But this experience of orchids was pretty cool because Oklahoma Contemporary also asked us to like make things to uh, for people to buy. And what they ended up doing is we had smaller um, orchids, this kind of size, that they asked um, to make, I forgot what it's called, or they, they attached pins so that you could have them as a decoration, um, like kind of a paper jewelry, which was pretty neat. These larger ones were for the background that I have, if you see on the Facebook event that I took with my mom. Um, and so, I, I really like the challenge of doing um, how do you get like this is an orchid that has I think six one two three four five six petals and how do you get that out of a paper a single sheet of paper which is tricky oh hello art guild so what I had learned is, in effect, you're, you sometimes think of 
how would something be like squished flat, like <laughs> roadkill or something? So if you've seen, like this one is a complicated orchid called a moth orchid. It looks really complicated, but when I kind of looked up kind of the biology and anatomy, I learned, oh, this bottom part is actually a very um, highly kind of like modified petal. And then these other five petals kind of act like, I guess for for their their pollinators, they're used to like directions. And this center part, they have, um, it's kind of a little area where where the pollinator has to come in and it's they're they're designed to attract very specific pollinators like bees or other things so here's a good example of what I'm making and so I learned that okay what you can do is um, kind of I can't get this center petal to fit in because there are other petals that will be in the way. So what I do is I move it kind of out of the way and then use folding like this to um, mimic the central location. And let me see, okay. This part is curved and there's kind of a little curvy thing like that. And then we saw that orchids kind of have two layers of petals, some in the back, which are these three that I'm doing right now, and then some in the front. And it's very interesting how just these slight curves of the paper um, to fold it creates that dimension of 3D nature. So, okay, cool. Um, what, I'm, what I've learned is to do a lot of mock-ups. Um, you can kind of see, let me move this. This is actually my latest very cool um, tool. It's called a, um, it's a company silhouette that makes a cutting machine. And so it's a plotting machine that for me, I was making, um, oh. This is a very early and flat mock-up, but I was making milkweed flowers. So Emma and I last, I think September, did a monarch butterfly and milkweed flower installation. Um, and so this is all hand cut. And I learned that, okay, milkweed flowers have a lot of little flowers. And this um, takes, when I was doing the actual um, pieces, it took like 30 to 45 minutes just to make one <laughs> um, uh, kind of ring of five petals and you can see kind of um, what what's interesting is each flower has five petals that point up and then five petals that point kind of down like so so that was pretty interesting but it was just taking too long to cut so we could only make a, I was, we were limited in how many things I could make um, reasonably. And my hands started hurting after I made um, 30 of these. <laughs> so I've got this cutting machine and I've been really excited because I can, um, it still takes a while. I can scan my cut patterns or my my like mock-ups. I can kind of scan them flat, and then using some software, I can get it to replicate all these cut lines. 
And that has been really interesting because I can show um, there's something I need to find the this is a coral polyp pattern that Emma printed and you can see kind of what I cut out were these coral designs and this is this will be coming up for this insulation we're still figuring out uh, once you get larger corals like this, how do you keep them um, sturdy so that they don't flop over? So that's the interesting thing about paper is, okay, here's a good example. This is a panther grouper. And you can see they get the panther name because of their spots. It's pretty sturdy paper. This is kind of a... Um, like a thin but heavyweight paper. And if I suspended it, which we've done with the butterflies, they work pretty well to like stay sturdy. But um, when they're not, uh, when they're not, um, when they're trying to be holding their, or when they try to hold their own weight, like this lionfish, they're not very strong. So we're trying to figure that out. And if you have any um, questions or stuff, oh, hi, Nick. Please ask and I'll try to check the chat if I can find it. But let's see. Next, I think what I'll do is just go through making things. So one of my recent tests was to um, was trying to make a seahorse actually. So I'm going to come back and get my mock-up that I did. Okay, here are some examples of the fish that have been cut actually by the cutting machine. So pretty accurate and I'm really pleased by how cleanly it's cutting. Um, and this just makes me really excited that I can make a whole school of fish. Okay, so I'm always learning. And one thing I've learned is when I was doing these, um, this is called a Royal Grandma um, fish. It actually has like a purple front and a yellow um, rear um, tail side. So this is kind of a happy accident that we had paper like this for another purpose. And what I learned is it's actually easier to think, how can you fold um, and get the kind of ridge line part and then think about what is, um, what else do I just need to cut off from the side so that I can get the bottom portion um, of the fish looking correctly. So like this, I learned, okay, I want this the front of the fish to be a little more rounded than it would be normally. So I can fold this down and cut off this bottom edge to maintain the, not create a bump in the jawline. And that's what I've done with this um, seahorse. So what I did was 
I actually first started with a sheet of paper just folded in half. Um, so I thought, okay, seahorses have kind of a little um, back portion where they have their back fin and then their head is really very curved and so is their tail. So what I can do is notice how it has all these little jagged parts. I can first start folding the head so that the kind of spine is the right curvature I want and then use scissors to cut out what excess I don't want. So let me try that with kind of a new sheet of paper. And feel free to ask questions because this all makes sense to me, but <laughs> trying to explain it maybe kind of, it helps me think, oh, there are stuff I haven't thought about and there's also stuff that it just makes sense because I figured it out a long time ago. So I'm going to try this seahorse. What I'm doing is let's go back to the um, I'm making the back portion of the seahorse. So it kind of looks like a little um, hump shape. And I'm not worrying too much about the paper on the left side because that will be kind of um, The paper on the left side will be cut off, so I'm just worrying about what does a seahorse look like. And actually, okay. Sometimes I need to get rid of paper so it's not too bulky. Ooh, okay. Let's see what the question is. There are some origami artists who plot, plot out their designs mathematically. Do you ever do that? Or is your process all visual and hands-on? And so, yes, I would say um, I am, this is definitely unorthodox origami <laughs> because origami traditionally uses a single square of paper that's not cut. So for that, the artists have a big challenge of, I think one artist called it, you're basically trying to figure out how to hide all that excess paper. So notice how I just cut the paper on the left. If it was an origami artist doing um, traditional origami, they would need to find a way of hiding all that paper. And so if you've noticed origami that has like, little um, complicated like fingers or other things. There's actually a lot of um, folding that they are, mathematic kind of figuring they have to do to get the right um, shape. And I've learned that there is um, some origami like modeling software, I think, where what they call it is a, it's called like a tree diagram, where if you took the paper and it was totally unfolded and still a square, they would be able to see where the, um, I think they call it crease patterns would be. And oftentimes the designs are so complicated that you, they wouldn't be able even to like list all the steps. I've seen like origami books where they have dozens or even, hundreds of steps. So a lot of it is where 
they just also need to do kind of their intuition to figure out how to um, shape a piece because it's just, it's too hard to describe all that. But I would say since I was developing this as a little kid, like first grade or something, I also, my, my first origami book was an unorthodox book by having big sheets of paper that they glued together. So it was called Origami Safari, and it was all these African animals um, and other animals. And it was very simple shapes, but they were showing, okay, if you needed to make something like, um, I think they had a giraffe or something, you needed several pieces of paper. So in a way, I'm kind of at least, I try to see how much I can do for one sheet of paper. If you check on my website, uh, with that yucca insulation, that's actually two sheets of paper, the yucca leaves and then the flowers. So eventually I learned, okay, I, I can make rules, but then if I need to, I can <laughs> break them because trying to get something like a yucca would be very difficult. So yes, I would say Sometimes, uh, let me give an example. Here's a thing, okay. I also just like to experiment because, or I haven't done in the past, but I've done more recently, is just experiment with cutting and folding. So I was like, what does this look like? I just cut little edges of paper at different, kind of lengths and played with that. So you may be wondering, what could this be? For me, because I keep a lot of, um, um, house plants and especially air plants. This is a little, um, bed from being stored in a box. What I decided is, oh, that kind of looks actually like a flower, like a flower spike that I've seen on these bromeliads. <coughs> so I'm just gonna make a really big one and then figure out how to make the leaves. And so this leaves, these leaves are one strip of paper that has been cut into like little fine points and then um, twist it around and then stuck in another um, base. So one thing I really like about paper is that it's so versatile, it can even be the support structure of another thing. That's how we had with our desert plant insulation is we wanted to make a, um, it was representing New Mexico's White Sands National, I think, monument where it's just very white sands, and there are these beautiful like yucca plants growing through there, and lots of very great um, photography that people have done. So I learned, yeah, just using white paper and actually scoring it, I can make like sand dunes and have that, um, have the sand dunes show up. So, okay, I'm going back to my, this is the example, small seahorse, now the larger seahorse. Okay. So the seahorse is kind of tricky because actually seahorse tails are longer than this and I'm going to have to Unfortunately, have a stubby tail, <laughs> but I'm, I did learn kind of this, I have these certain folds that I know, okay, this is how you get a slight angle is to not totally um, twist this around. 
And then for this, you can really see that with just this part, you can see the top of the seahorse. Oops. Okay, that was pretty good for a copy paper where I was actually limited by the length of the paper. So this will teach me to get a longer paper or make the center part smaller. So what I found is that I've done like realistic drawing and stuff and I'm okay, but I can't just immediately draw something. So I just learned, I just have to keep remaking things to get the right proportions. This one is a good example where I have a fish called a chromis that is not this um, kind of short. This almost looks like a goldfish in a way, if it was pink, but I feel that, um, okay, this one was not good, so I'm going to just keep reworking because now with this cutting machine, I am able to um, think of different versions and get closer to the final pattern. So after several iterations, I got this. And let me see if I can get him to it's a little fishy too. Okay. So this is a nice kind of test case of Oh, yes. So this is kind of my latest version of that fish, which will be green. So actually, I have some green paper that let's see if I can make one. And previously, I actually would not have drawn out or done anything. It would have all been by sight. So I kind of learned pretty fast that um, as much as drawing helps, it, uh, it does take a while to figure out how much you really need to draw because a lot of things will be kind of cut over or missing. So this is, this is just me roughly getting the general shapes. So like I said kind of before, one thing I'm looking for is how do I get all the pieces of the animal to fit. So notice this fin, because it's actually, it's called a pectoral fin and it's on the side, you can't easily um, add this without either like gluing or attaching a separate piece. So I extended it down below the bottom fin Hopefully my pencil will show up. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you, um, Art Gill, for those questions previously. I will miss, I'll be looking forward when we have more in-person demonstrations because 
it's nice to have a live audience to get feedback. And you may, may be wondering why I'm doing all this, kind of like really obsessing over the shapes. That's because I kept marine aquariums um, since I was a teenager. And a lot of these fish I've chosen because they were very colorful and they're often the common aquarium fish that you see at pet stores and online. So it's just kind of a way to remember what I was interested in as a kid and recreate that. I think I'm always, I was often making things, sometimes even like reenacting wildlife programs as a little kid. I remember, ooh, Lawrence has a question above. How tall can you make the stem of flowering plant before weight becomes an issue. Oh yeah, so one of the things interesting, that um, yucca was like over seven feet tall, <laughs> which is interesting. And it's because I did not, um, I had to be very careful with the paper to not get a crease that would weaken it. And what I did was eventually make it a kind of it's like a half cylinder. So paper is very strong on the kind of um, up and down and like this, um, this uh, flower, if it's kind of curled around, you can think like a straw or a, um, there's this, interesting crafting to make a plant out of a newspaper, rolled up newspaper, where you cut it and then like, after you tw have twisted it a lot, you can make a really long, like, um, kind of shaggy plant thing. So, I don't know. I have <laughs> not reached the limit yet, um, but we learned, okay, so, I'll show the sad, sad remnants of that flower. Okay, so here's it slowly going and going. Um, and then here, sadly, it, it had a weakness and bent. And at that point, one thing I learned is, okay, you can kind of see it's slowly getting wider. So even just a slight thickness will really help. And then here at the base, this base part was um, stuck into the um, yucca leaf. And the leaves were really tightly wound so that I could mimic the, um, the, uh, kind of compact structure of, of a yucca. This is, this is not a yucca, but this is kind of the overall goal is to really um, have a spiral that's twisted tightly. And that can actually be very strong. So good question. I, I think it really depends on Here's our milkweed insulation. We also made, um, what are these called? Chrome, eh, cone flowers, sorry. Okay, so cone flowers also have a stem with leaves. And I learned this is a very in, in, interesting kind of, you just learn things from making stuff. And I learned, which this may be, this is probably an old practice thing. I learned that I could wrap this around and um, let's 
not working and I think that's because it tore. I learned I could use these little leaf segments to hook in and keep the um, twisted paper from unfurling. And with just that aspect, it really helped these stems stay um, compact and let's see how big this is, maybe two feet tall. So that was really nice to see. We're kind of getting close to the natural um, plants. And I would say in general, I am doing a lot of what's called biomimicry. So if you think about plants, they are actually also just made out of very simple fibers and stuff. How are they staying so strong? It's often they've aligned their kind of fibers to uh, help create support and they use, um, that's also why they need water. So if you've seen a wilted plant, often it's not having enough water to create kind of a water pressure that keeps the stems from falling over. So let me go back to this. Yeah, thank you for that question. We are eventually, um, I made a stingray and that was pretty cool, but the tail is very long. So we're kind of finding, and that's what we did with some of the, um, the milkweed insulation is we eventually just had to put a little wire through the center so it wouldn't um, tilt over too much. So I kind of still feel as long as I'm fulfilling the spirit of the kirigami, I don't have to get worried about um, being too inaccurate. This is tricky because if you see with this head, I think I was doing the design a little early where I had the gill pointed to the back, but I actually didn't need it that much. And it's very interesting how just subtle shapes can, or subtle folding can create the illusion. I think I'm going to have to really get this. This paper is pretty thick. And this is actually the exact color paper of the coneflower stems. So we were trying to find sturdy paper that would help the stem stay up. Now I'll make my One thing I'll say, this is a, um, this installation that we're doing in Tulsa is a coral reef where what, what we are calling it is seed reef because we're doing an interesting take that part of the reef will actually be bleached and you may have may, may or may have not heard that Coral reefs are under threat by not just climate change, but other things. And um, one part of that is a lot of coral reefs are having bleaching events where the corals, I, usually it's water temperatures that are too high and the corals just release all their 
symbiotic um, algae and they turn um, bright white and eventually die. So our, our aim with this um, installation is to have part of the reef be bleached and just kind of sad um, looking where we'll invite the public to help rebuild the reef by uh, we'll have paper and things kind of instructions for them to make their own coral or make their own fish and add it to the damaged portion to help rebuild it. So it's kind of a way that we're trying to see how can our art be more than just um, talking about issues, but um, getting people involved in action. And the cool thing about Telsa is they have their Oklahoma Aquarium in Jenks, so I has, we have still not figured out, but i really like to see how we can collaborate with them. So here's, here's the little fish, and all you need is just little eyes. So kind of imagine a school of this fish, it looked pretty neat. That's one thing we've learned with the milkweed project is that we just had milkweed and coneflowers and monarch butterflies. But in mass, that was really cool to see a lot of them um, kind of floating around. I do like, we, we use, um, nylon monofilament kind of that clear fishing line to suspend things and it's just really neat to see things suspended so my first ever kirigami installation was a circle of um, birds that I called an aviary and I didn't think about it but when people visited it they actually decided to stand in the center it's like a suspended spiral that's going um up towards the ceiling and people were standing in the middle and take pi taking pictures and I never would have thought of that so it's kind of a need to see how people respond to your art and with the with the yucca especially some people actually got confused and thought it was a real yucca indoors so that's kind of our it's neat to f fool the eye and I also just like doing kind of challenges. Let's see if this is zooming in. So this will be, it's called an orchid dotty back. <laughs> and you can see the, this purple paper is perfect. Um, what we're trying to do is make life-size fish. So this one is a little close to life-sized. And it's been nice to do these small kind of mock-ups because it doesn't really matter if you get it wrong. You kind of learn, even from this tiny fish, I'm thinking, oh, just this um, tilt of the head looks like a real thing. So this one will actually be pretty easy to make. Here's the kind of coral that we're working on. Um, this was scrap paper. And our next goal is to just try and figure out how do you make giant corals that are near life size, which are sometimes feet or several feet wide. And I'm trying to figure that out, that out of, when it's small, paper is pretty strong. But as it gets bigger, this paper is actually kind of thicker Bristol paper, and that's why it's holding up so well. But even still, I learned that this flower stalk will slowly bend over because it's just supporting itself with no folds or stuff. Um, yeah, I think I've been rambling, so I'll stop for any questions or comments. Trying to see what time it is. Oh, 7.55. Okay. So if anyone has any questions,
questions or comments, feel free to post it in the chat. I'll Okay, first question is, what kind of paper do you usually use? I've used mostly kind of a thicker paper that's called Paris paper for pens. And that's because it's originally designed for ink pens where it's kind of like Bristol paper. That's what this, um, this it's a white paper that's pretty smooth. And I had bought it specifically for pens because I was noticing there was a lot of bleed. So if you see in this inside, there's almost no bleed in the paper. But I liked how it is kind of sturdy and thin. So you were noticing with this, this green chromis fish, I was having a tough time folding it because it, it's maybe a little too thick. But yes, I really like this Paris paper. Um, this is actually a nice um, cotton paper for the lionfish. And this is just really good for printmaking also. So that's what, working with Emma, it was just very nice to work with. Um, Ryan asks, what's your preferred pa paper type between dyeing and printing and then doing the folding? Yes, so we, it's kind of strange. This, um, let's see. We actually, I, we don't actually know, this is some donated paper to Art Space at Untitled. And, um, They are just like kind of medium thick sheets. Um, and mostly I don't like paper that is too, uh, that doesn't handle folding. So I'll show a paper that was tricky. Um, this is, I don't know, some other scrap paper that when it folds, Notice that it gets kind of um, weak. And we were noticing, I was, these were used for the milkweed stems that they were, if I try to curl them up, they were slowly fraying and tearing. So I don't know. I'm not sure how to figure that out. Um, what I've learned from folding and doing these kind of thicker papers is the less folds you add, the better. Um, as you start kind of overworking them, they get weak. Yes, it is trial and error. <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, I was kind of late starting, so I can have a couple of minutes. And thank you to the people who just came recently. Yeah, my name is Malcolm Zachariah and I'm doing a Kirigami demo. Feel free to, I think you'll be able to watch it after it gets um, processed by uh, Facebook. So thank you guys. Yeah, stay tuned and I, I'll be posting more updates which I put, I think, my Instagram page is the best way to follow me um, because I try to give all my work in progress and stuff. And you'll be seeing more of these um, Kirigami works in the future. 
So thank you. Yes, thank you, Art Guild, for hosting this. Um, it's always fun to share my art. Okay, thank you again, everyone. So have a good night.